You guys can have a seat. What a, what a, what a beautiful day. I mean, I hope that, that being a part of this, for everybody in this room, like I hope the significance of watching people come up here and get in the water and go underwater and come out of the water, I hope that that's not lost on us. Like I hope that's not something that we take for granted. Like I hope that that is what we understand we live for as Christ followers. To see our brothers and sisters make that commitment in front of us with our support and with our love, I hope that that's something that profoundly affects us for the rest of our life, that we remember days like today forever. And today's a special day, and it's not just special because we get to see people get baptized and we get to see this ancient tradition, this ancient symbol that's been passed down for us, but in about 25 minutes, we're all gonna stand up and we're gonna go to the communion table. And as a family, we're gonna have communion together. We're gonna partake in another ancient symbol, another ancient ritual, a practice that was commanded by Jesus for us to do. And then it got handed to his disciples who then passed it down to the early church fathers, who then passed it down for generation and generation and generation. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we're still baptizing people, and we're still going to the communion table together and eating the communion meal together. Uh, it's such a beautiful thing. Now, on a day where we do both of these sacraments, where we participate in baptism and we participate in communion, it's probably worth just discussing, like, what is it that we believe happens when people get baptized? What is it that we believe happens when we go, when we eat the bread and we drink the wine at the communion table? At 514 Church, the, the theological tradition that we come from, we don't actually believe that baptism or the communion table is a mode or a mechanism to unlock part of God's grace. We believe that the reality of you being an adopted child of God is a reality that you can step into at any moment through faith. And the grace that God has for you, the gift that he has for you is a reality that we can experience at any moment through faith. But because that's our theology, you know, we have to be careful because it would be to our detriment to take these beautiful symbols like baptism and these beautiful symbols like communion and to degrade them and pretend like they're not important and to pretend like they're not profound and to pretend like maybe even that they're just like nice to have when we can afford it or when we can, it's convenient for us. Uh, that, that, that couldn't be further from the truth. These symbols, these practices, they're important. And symbols and practices are important in our faith life because what a symbol or, or, or a practice does is it takes a reality that's already true, that we can already step into, that we can already believe, it takes that reality and it helps us feel it. It helps us see it. It helps us touch it and experience it in real time and in real space, right here, right now, in our flesh and blood. You know, when you think about the kind of people that we are, the kind of beings that we are, there's all kinds of beauty in this world that is out there for us to experience. The creation that God has given us is a beautiful thing. The grace that he gives us is beautiful and it's meaningful. This truth is available, but it seems like in my life, it seems like I spend a lot of my days and a lot of my time trying to avoid that beauty. You get caught in the checklist and you get caught in the day to day and you get caught in what you have to get done. And it's like, there's all this beauty out there, but it's hard for us to grasp that beauty sometimes. It's hard for us to feel it, it's hard for us to experience it, it's hard for us to really think that that reality is a part of our reality. And when you think back at your own life and you start to think about the ways in which the beauty of this world or the beauty of God's truth has truly affected you, like arrested you and transformed you, chances are it wasn't a moment where you heard something and an idea clicked, where you conceptualized something intellectually. Most likely in the moments in your life where you have been profoundly affected and transformed and changed by the beauty of truth was a moment where you came face to face with it, where you experienced it for yourself, a moment where you encountered that beauty and that truth. You know, I think about my own life and I think about all of these times where that has been the case, where I'm living in this world full of beauty and the grace of God and the gifts of God and the beautiful truth of God, but sometimes... You can't grasp the beauty until you actually taste it for yourself. Until you actually taste it for yourself. Um, when I think about my own life and the parts of me that were formed and shaped, uh, the beautiful way that I am 
today, both good and bad in all of my humanity, one of the places that I personally have to go to think about how I got to be this way is the baseball field. This is where I grew up. I grew up playing baseball. This was everything to me. This became a vital part of who I was. A lot of the things I've learned in terms of good qualities like, like leadership and teamwork and performance and the drive to succeed, it all came from this baseball field. And then a lot of the tragic parts of my personality, the way in which I try to gain value and get worth and perform so that people love me, right back here to the baseball field. This is where it all came from. Huge parts of me were beautifully and tragically formed by playing baseball. And so today is March 31st, I think. And that means that opening day for Major League Baseball was on Thursday. Free Coney Dogs at Skyline on opening day. It's a tip. That one's for free. Um, and so I am aware that baseball right now in this country is a reality. It's happening. Baseball is occurring. I can, I can check scores. I can check stats. I can even turn the game on and watch a couple innings. It's, I'm aware of that reality. It's here. It's true. It's real. But it's not until I go to the ballpark and I smell the grass and I taste the hot dog with stadium mustard on it, which is the only acceptable way to eat a hot dog, and I hear the sound of the ball coming off the bat and I hear the sound of the, the ball uh, popping against a leather mitt. It's not until that moment that all of this nostalgia and all of the formation and all of the beauty of how, what baseball means to me comes flooding back into my life and I come face to face with it. Baseball's a reality whether I'm at the ballpark or not, but when I show up and I taste it for myself, I can grasp the beauty of what this sport has meant for me in my life. If you think about all of the, the way, the, all the things in this world, like the wonders of this world that are both natural and man-made, and, and we're aware that all of these things exist, but it's like hard to, to grasp that. So when I was seven years old, I was taught about the pyramids in Egypt. And I remember learning about them, and learning about the geometrical perfection of these pyramids, and the scale and the size of these pyramids, and being kind of blown away that these things were built by people, by brick by brick over hundreds of years, they built these giant, enormous, mathematically, um, just, I mean, mathematically advanced structures. And I remember seven years old, I was like, that's crazy that these things actually exist. And so that means that from the time I was seven until now, I have been aware that the pyramids in Giza are a reality in this world. They exist. That beauty is here. It's a part of us. It's a part of this world. But in 2014, when I was traveling for work, um, we were trying to open some stores in the Middle East, and we were in Cairo, and I actually got to go see the pyramids, and I got to walk up to the pyramids, and I stood there, and I saw that the, the foundation bricks that go all the way around and then go all the way up are almost as tall as me, and they stack all the way up to the sky, and I sat there, and I saw it. And I thought about what I knew about the pyramids, and I saw it against the blue sky, and I could smell the desert, and I could hear the camels and the donkeys. And in that moment, I was just knocked back on my heels, this thing that I was aware of, when I could actually taste it for myself. It was like I fully grasped the beauty of it. Uh, one thing that my wife Jenna and I have made a priority in our marriage and in our relationship is that we want to travel and we want to see things. And I got to see a lot of the world for, for my last job. And I want to experience that with her. And so we travel. And we've been fortunate enough to go on some pretty amazing trips and see some pretty amazing things. Um, but one of the things that affected me more than anything else was, was a couple years ago we were in Italy. And we went to this city called Cinque Terre. And Cinque Terre is on the coast. And it's these lush green mountains with these colorful houses that overlook a sparkling blue ocean, the, the bluest ocean that you've ever seen. And it's this picturesque city that people go to simply because it's beautiful. And so I had seen the postcards. I had looked at the website and I had seen the scenery and the beauty and I was aware that this beauty existed, that it was here, that it was a reality. But when you take the train from Florence, you are in a tunnel. And you're in a tunnel and you get close to Cinque Terre, and all of a sudden, the light starts to flicker. And it's, it's too quick, you can't really see what's out there, but you know something's changing, the light's hitting you. You're going into a different space. And so you keep reading, or you keep on your computer, whatever it is that you're doing, and then all of a sudden, the tunnel breaks. 
and you turn, and you see the blue ocean, and you see the houses on the lush green mountains, and you see the sky, and you see the sun sparkling off the water, and you smell the salt water. And there's been very few times in my life where I felt like my breath was taken away by beauty, and this was one of those moments. I turned and I looked and I saw it. I saw it for myself. I encountered it. I tasted it. And I was arrested by it. And when you think about those things that I'm talking about, you know, baseball, um, the pyramids of Giza, the Cinque Terre in Italy, all of these places exist. They are all a reality that is already here. That beauty is already in this world. But sometimes you can't grasp the beauty until you taste it for yourself. And as we talk about our faith and as we baptize people and as we go to the communion tables, this is an important principle for us to understand how that pertains to our walk with Christ. Because if you think about what we profess and proclaim as Christians, about the beautiful truth of what God has done for us, it is one of the most beautiful conceptual ideas that you will ever be able to try to wrap your mind around. The story that we claim we've stepped into is perhaps the greatest love story that's ever been told. And not only has it been told, but we believe it's true. We believe it's a reality in which we're living in. That what Jesus has done for us on the cross and in his resurrection, in his plan to redeem us, and in his action to redeem us, is perhaps the most beautiful truth that we can ever experience. But I think that as Christians sometimes, it's okay for us to admit that the beautiful truth of what Jesus has done for us is sometimes hard to grasp. Like we wish, and sometimes we pretend, that we just walked around this world always understanding that we are a part of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That that reality of what he's done, how he's freed us, how he saved us, is just found who we are in all things that we do in all of our life. But sometimes that's not true. Sometimes the beautiful truth of what Jesus has done for you feels far away, if you can touch it at all. It feels distant. It feels like it's not a part of your reality. It feels like it's hard to understand. And so as we move into a season of Easter, we're going to celebrate Good Friday, which celebrates the cross and the death of Jesus. And then we're going to go to Resurrection Sunday or Easter morning, which celebrates the resurrection of Jesus. And as we go into that season on a day that we celebrate communion and we celebrate baptism, I think that it's probably appropriate for us to ask the question and to wonder what is exactly the truth that we claim is so beautiful about the Christian faith? What is the story that we're actually celebrating with baptism and communion and Good Friday and Easter? And the beautiful truth of what Jesus has done for us could be summed up in the cross and the resurrection. And the cross and the resurrection are a part of a story that we call the gospel, which means the good news. And the gospel is this truth uh, that tells us that this world was created by a good God. And the world is good. And we are images of the God that we worship. And so we are good. We are good. This world is good. But it doesn't really take a detective to, to understand that this world is not how it's supposed to be. You look around you and you look at the brokenness and you look at the sin and you look at the death and you look at the darkness and you look at the, all of the things that are happening in this world, you can see that we are deeply confused, that we are deeply confused, that instead of living as full images of God, we tend to live these subhuman lives where we give ourselves away to all of this evil, to all of these forces of darkness, and we worship things that aren't God. And this power is so pervasive in our lives. It so captivates us that we can't actually save ourselves from it. And so we need somebody to save us. We need a savior. We need someone to come and heal us. We need someone to come and change our reality. And that's the gospel story. What we believe happened when we celebrate Good Friday and Easter is we believe that, that God became flesh and blood in the person of Jesus and confront that evil is exactly what he did. And so he goes up on the cross. And at that moment on the cross, all of the sin and all of the evil and all of these powers and principalities of darkness that are both within us and outside of us acting upon us, they all culminate. They all come to a crescendo, and they all extinguish themselves on God in the flesh on the cross. And he wears it. He becomes it. And he suffers the consequences of it, which is death. And so he dies. 
You know, the Apostle Paul says that the wages of sin is death. The price of sin is death. We die because there's evil and darkness and sin in this world. That is the ultimate consequence of all of these forces, all of this evil. The trump card that it has over us, the power that it enslaves us with is death. And Jesus wore that, and he became that, and he suffered that consequence. And he died, and he went into the tomb, a dead man. And the reason that we call ourselves Christians, and the reason that we're Easter people, resurrection people, is because we believe that he didn't actually stay dead. That that moment happened, that he wore our sin, he bore our shame, he went into the tomb, suffered the consequences, he died, and yet a few days later he rose from the dead in a new body, new creation, resurrection life. And the reason this is theologically significant is because if the ultimate consequence of sin and evil and darkness is death, if that's all the power that it has to wield over us, if that is the ultimate consequence of these forces, then what happens when death can't hold you? What power does sin and evil and darkness have over you if its trump card is defeated? If it's last ditch effort, all that it has, all the power to enslave us in death, if that's defeated, then what power does it have left? What sting does it have left? What bite does it have left? And the answer that we Christians give is that it doesn't. It has no power over Jesus. It has no power over his resurrected body. He defeated death and therefore defeated sin and evil forever on the cross and in his resurrection. But the the crazy thing about our faith, like the thing that sometimes we find it hard to grasp is that we don't just think that Jesus defeated death. We think that somehow, some way, we are actually bound to Jesus. That we are actually attached to Christ and to the Christ event and to the death and the resurrection of Christ. The Apostle Paul, once again, says that we are in Christ. We are in Christ And there's all kinds of prepositions you could use instead of that. You could say we're with him. You could say by him, through him, because of him. But he says we're in Christ. We are in Christ, which means that we're bound to him, which means that what happened to Jesus is happening to us, which means that what is true of Jesus in his defeat of darkness and sin and death is true of us. Why? Because we're bound to Christ. We are in Christ. That is the truth. That is the beauty. That is the beautiful truth of the cross and the resurrection of the gospel story that we tell about ourselves and about Jesus. And while we all sit here and think about that and say, that is beautiful truth. That is amazing. I can't believe that we get to be a part of that story. If we're honest with ourselves, that idea of being bound to a historical event, being bound to the person of Christ, being in Christ, Uh, is a beautiful truth that is actually sometimes very, very difficult for us to grasp. It's hard to walk around and feel that. It's hard to walk around and think that that is a reality in which you are participating in right now. But it's true. And so we preach it, and we teach it, and we say it, and we try to conduct our lives accordingly, but we don't just preach it, and we don't just teach it. So a truth that that beautiful, that hard to grasp, we don't just say it. We get into the baptismal and we show it. We show it. We get into the baptismal and just as Christ was entirely overwhelmed by sin and evil and darkness on the cross, we go under the water totally overwhelmed by sin and evil and darkness on the cross. And just as he bore the penalty, the payment, just as he bore the consequence of those forces, we too go into the water And symbolically, underneath the water, we die. And then just as Christ was raised from the dead by the power of the resurrection, we too come out of the water bathed in the light of the resurrection. New creation, new life. Why do we do this? Because we're trying to show and feel and see and hear and taste the truth that we are bound to Christ on the cross and his resurrection. And so we show it in the water. This is what symbols do. Paul uh, says in his letter to the Romans, he says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. Under the water we go. Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too are raised so we may live a new life. Out of the water we come. New creation bound to Christ. 
This is our reality as Christians. And it's such a profound and beautiful truth that it's hard to grasp, it's hard to put our hands on, it's hard to feel. And so we do things like baptism and communion. And baptism and communion are symbols in which we participate to remind us of a truth in which we are already participating. The reality of the Christ event and who we are in Christ. The reality of us being bound to our Savior is already true through faith. It's true of us. What happened to Jesus is happening to us. What's true of Jesus is true now of us. That is a reality, but it's a reality that's hard to grasp. And so we participate in symbols and meals and rituals in order to remind us and give us handles on the reality in which we were already participating. And that's why today is so special. That's why baptism is so special. And that's why here in a moment when we all stand and we go to the communion table, to once again celebrate Christ on the cross, uh, it's special. It's special because communion is a meal, a sacred meal, in which we get to participate as his followers. Um, It's not any meal. It's not like breakfast or lunch or dinner. It's not uh, for sustenance. It's a holy, sacred, symbolic meal that just like baptism represents the way in which we're attached and bound to what Jesus did for you. And for me, and he gives us a meal, and he commands us to perform this meal together as a community of people who believe that we are in Christ. And in order to understand what it is that we're celebrating when we go to the baptism table, in order to understand maybe why Jesus gave this command, you got to go back to the life of Jesus, and you got to start to think about what he was doing and why he was doing it. And so you go to the end of his life, and you come to the last week that he was alive, and he goes into Jerusalem. And by going into Jerusalem where all of these powers are, all of these powerful people who want him dead, he knows that the clock is ticking. That's probably it. That when he walks into the city, he's going to be arrested and tried and put on a cross and killed. And so he chooses a week to do that. And the week that he chooses is the Passover week. So Jesus goes into the city on the Passover week. And the Passover is this... um, Jewish tradition that they do every single year. It's one of the most important parts of their calendar. And it culminates with the Passover cedar or the Passover meal. And this meal is a celebration of the story of the Exodus. So if you read your Old Testaments, you'll read this story of the Exodus. And in the Exodus story, what happens is that God has chosen a man named Abraham. And through Abraham, he's going to make a nation of people who are going to be his people. And, they will be, and he will be their God. And so Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. And the nation begins. And these 12 sons end up in Egypt. And they end up in Egypt prospering. They end up fruitful. They end up flourishing and multiplying. And they're so good at this that, that Pharaoh, who rules Egypt, the most powerful man in the world, sees their flourishing and he says, I can't have that. That's a, that's a threat to me. And so he enslaves them. And for 400 years, they are enslaved in bondage and hard labor, building structures out of brick and mortar. And the Exodus story that the Passover celebrates is a story about how God reaches his hand into the lives of his people and delivers them by parting the Red Sea, escaping Egypt and Pharaoh into freedom, into new life, into a life with him. And so every year, they get together, and they celebrate this with a symbolic meal. And it's not just any meal. Like, all of the pieces of the meal have this really important symbolic nature to it. So, for example... Uh, They start the meal off, and they pick up a a leafy green called the carpus leaf. And they take the carpus leaf, which symbolizes uh, springtime, which symbolizes fruitfulness, prosperity, flourishing. And they take that symbol of prosperity and flourishing that represents how they went into Egypt and became a flourishing people, and they swirl it around in salt water, and they stir it. And when they pull it out, it drips salty water, which symbolizes tears, Because the prosperity and flourishing is turned to despair and slavery. And so they take this symbol of prosperity and flourishing turns to slavery and despair. And they don't just talk about it. And they don't just preach it. And they don't just teach it. They take it and they eat it. They chew it. They swallow it. They eat it. 
And they take uh, something called the bitter herb, which would be like horseradish. So it's like if you've ever eaten raw horseradish, it will make you cry, okay? And they take this horseradish, which symbolizes the, 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 this bitter herb. It symbolizes the bitterness of bondage. And they dip it into a sticky, sweet sauce that represents the mortar in which they would lay bricks. So they take the, the, the bitterness of bondage and they dip it into a sauce that symbolizes the actual hard labor and task that they did for 400 years and they sw- swirl it together. They hold it up and they don't just talk about what happened to them. They don't just talk about their God. They take that symbol and they eat it. They eat it. And then at the end of the meal, they take the unleavened bread, the, the, the matzah, and this is a symbol of freedom. Because before God delivered them into freedom, he told them the provisions and supplies that they had to get for themselves. And there's not enough time to wait for the bread to rise, so they eat unleavened bread. And so this is what they eat after their escape. And so after the Passover meal, they take a piece of this bread and they take this symbol of freedom and deliverance, this symbol of redemption, this symbol of a faithful God who acts for his people and works in this world, and they take that and they don't just teach it and they don't just preach it and they don't just talk about it. They take that truth and they eat it. They eat it. And so Jesus takes his disciples to the upper room and he has the Passover cedar with them, the Passover meal. And at the end of the meal, he gives them a new meal because there's a new covenant coming. There's a new promise coming. There's a new exodus coming. There's a new deliverance from slavery and bondage and evil. And so he gives them a new meal to celebrate that. This is what Paul recounts of that event in his letters to the Corinthians. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So Jesus said, what's going to happen tomorrow on the cross, that's the new exodus. That's the new Passover. That's the new deliverance from slavery and bondage of all of these forces of evil and darkness that enslave us. I am performing a new exodus, and it's going to come by the breaking of my body and the spilling of my blood. And so when you guys get together as a community, break this bread like my body will be broken. Drink this wine like my blood will be spilled and remember what reality you're living in. Paul goes on to say, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The cross is our reality. The resurrection is our reality. And just as the Jewish people had a meal to symbolize, to put handles on, to bring sensory perception to their exodus from Egypt, we have communion. And communion is the sacred meal of the new covenant, of the reality of Christ broken and bleeding on the cross for you and for me to complete the gospel story. And that's a beautiful truth. There is beauty in that truth that's hard to even articulate. It's hard to put words around. It's hard to even put images to, you know, and we walk around on a day-to-day basis, and and sometimes in my own faith journey, I wonder how much I really believe that that's true. Did God really do that for me? Did he really become flesh and blood, and did he really break his flesh and spill his blood to heal me, to save me, to change me, to transform me? Do I really believe that that's true? And there's a lot of us in this room who have things in our life and things that have happened to us that make that reality really, really hard to grasp. They make it really hard to grasp. A lot of people are in this room and they hear that story and they like it and they want to believe it and they want to think that that was their reality, but they sit there and they think, you know, if you knew what I was like, if you knew what I've done, if you knew the people that I've hurt the relationships that I've burned, if you knew the ways that my life is not the way that I think it's supposed to be, if you knew what I struggle with behind closed doors, I'm not so sure that you would be certain that the God of the universe would become flesh and blood and then break his flesh and spill his blood for me in that state and in that condition. There's a lot of people in this room who grew up 
And they were told lies about themselves, told lies about their identity. Someone like your parents, maybe, your mom or your dad, or maybe your spouse, somebody who you trusted, someone you cared about. They showed you through their actions that you weren't worth it, that you weren't worthy of their love, that you weren't worthy of their sacrifice. And so we hear this story, and we sit there, and we say, if I wasn't even worth it to my dad, if I wasn't even worth it to my mom or my spouse, how am I supposed to believe that the creator and the sustainer of the universe thought I was worth doing what he did? And we wrestle with this reality, but it's true. It's true. It's hard to grasp, but it's true. The cross and the resurrection tell you that, that you are worth it, that wherever you are, you will be met, you will be changed, you will be transformed, you will be healed, you will be restored, you will be redeemed. But that's a hard truth grasp. It's a really hard truth to grasp. And I don't want to stand up here and, and patronize people and say, you know, you're believing lies, and so here's the truth bomb for you. You should go believe this truth instead. That's not really how trauma works. Not really how trauma works. You know, it attaches itself to us. It binds to us. Our experiences inform us. They shape us. And so for me to just stand here and say, you should hear this message, hear this gospel, and go live totally different, change your life. Take this conceptualization of a God who loves you and try to go make that real in the world. You know, I don't know how well that actually works. And so this truth about who God is, you know, we don't just teach it. We don't just preach it. We don't just say it. And we don't just hope that you take it and intellectualize something meaningful in your life. We stand up and we go over to the communion table and we touch it. And we grab it, and we hold it, and we dip it, and then we eat it. We eat that truth of who God is. Because if we're honest with ourselves, the, the, the beauty of the truth of what Jesus has done for us is sometimes too much for us. It's really too much for us to grasp, and sometimes you can't grasp the beauty until you taste it for yourself. Let's pray. God, thank you for this community of people. Thank you for all of uh, our brothers and sisters who got baptized today and publicly displayed the way in which they are bound to you and bound to your death and bound to your resurrection. And that is a true reality that they are living in right now, God. I pray that this community of people who witness that can be the backbone, backbone of their support, can be the wind in their sails as they go off into a new life of new creation bathed in the light of your resurrection. God, I pray for this time of communion. I pray that you can help us grasp the truth of who you are by being with us as we taste that truth of who you are that almost unfathomable reality of how loved we are, how saved we are, how restored and redeemed we are, that you can help put handles on that for us as we take that truth and we eat it. God, thank you for who you are and thank you for everything you've done. It's in your name we pray, amen. So everybody can stand up here in a second, okay, right now actually. That was, that was confusing. Um, and what we're going to do is uh, when I say I'm done talking, which will be in 15 seconds, we're all going to go to one of the four communion tables that's around the room. There's one over here. Uh, there's two over here. There's one in the back. There's one over there by the exit doors. And every station has gluten-free. Uh, so go wherever is easiest for you. And I just want you to take that piece of bread and, and feel that truth in your hand the truth of Jesus and who we are. Feel it in your hand and watch it dip into the wine, which is grape juice, and watch it and then see it and then taste it. And come back to your seats and just have a moment of reflection and prayer with God and pray that you can encounter him today and that you can open your eyes to the reality in which we're already participating, all right? So we can go to the communion tables.
think about John's message, I think about baptism, I think about how what's happening to Jesus is happening to us. You guys can sit down, you can't leave yet because I have an announcement. Um, what, what I think about is in the first service, Joe got baptized and I did Joe's wedding. And at Joe's wedding, the same thing happened uh, that it happens at every wedding. It is called the train gang. You know, come on, ride the train. Who's ever done that at a wedding? You just, you just start getting crazy. The snake, you know, goes through the room. And that's kind of how I see it. It's like Jesus raises from the dead. He's like, come on, you want to raise too? Let's go. Like everybody else gets to jump in line. Like what happened to him is happening to us. So if he starts kicking his feet, we all start kicking our feet. It's just like this amazing reality that, that that's not just an idea and it's not just a symbol. Like you are gonna be fully transformed into this new creation that Jesus is already the picture of your future. That's amazing, that, that, that's, that's incredible. And so we celebrate the beginning of forever with baptism. That, that's really, really fun. And so when you think about being on the, 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 the chain gang and you think about following Jesus, I mean, who doesn't want to get a, be a part of that? I mean, who do, don't you want to be all in on that? Don't you want to be like part of following Jesus and experiencing the goodness that he has to offer, the defeat over death? That, that's, that, who doesn't want to take that in large quantities? I mean, that's what we want. That's what we need. And so when we say we're all in, that's a very important statement, and I'm going to talk about that at a very acute, like, heart level for the next two weeks with a series called All In. And All In is a series that is about groundbreaking generosity, because the, the scriptures say that if you're all in on Jesus, then there's a direct connection to the way you view your finances, the way you, do, you, the way you view money. And ultimately, next week, I'm going to talk about how money has become, for so many of us, a God that we elevate above Jesus. And how when we do that, we don't, we don't let go of it. We worship it. We chase it. And that's the worst spot for it to be. And when you truly make God number one and you're all in and following Him, then it's reflected in generosity. And people that experience Jesus transform into generous giving beings that breathe life and goodness everywhere they go with everything they have it's part of what happens to you when you follow Jesus and so I want to challenge our church you need to be here because when you say you want all in on Jesus part of being all in is following him and giving him the darkest corners of your hearts and giving him the seat the head seat at the table in your heart and money is arguing and fighting for that spot every single day so we're going to talk about that so the next two weeks we're going to do all in and two weeks from now the week before easter we're going to have a commitment who raise your hand if you made a commitment to the first all in that is why we are building that is why when you go over there you see bulldozers that's because of you guys that's because you gave and that's the future of new people's lives getting changed that's because you're all in we need everyone to be all in, otherwise we're not all in. So I want you to start praying right now. If you've made a commitment, I want you to start praying about your commitment. What was it? Are you on track with it? If you haven't made a commitment to all in, then it's time for you to think about how your finances intersect with your faith. It's time for you to make a decision too, and in two weeks, everyone gets an opportunity to recommit or commit to this church financially for the first time. Don't run from it if your faith matters. This is an important day. This is an important season. So we will see you guys next week for All In. Thank you for being here. We'll see you then.